So with that mindset and principle, let's review what we studied last time. Andal's law, right? I'm hoping most of you remember, right? Um, which was about that things end up being choked. The amount, total amount of improvement is always choked on the slowest path, right? In a very substantial way. You remember the 10x improvement on CPU leading to only 1.8x improvement on the overall improvement, right? Okay. Second thing that we learned was everything has a latency. Okay, latency is the delay between cause and effect. Okay, so even something that feels like it's instantaneous has a latency. Okay, uh, and we need to think about it, particularly when we are dealing with large volumes of data, large volumes of information, because the tiny latency can add up. The last thing that we learned was throughput hides latency. In fact, the only purpose of throughput is to hide latency. All right. So with that, let's actually get started with a simplified model of GPU. This diagram, all of you would remember, yes. CPU, GPU, connected by usually 16 lanes, right? 16 lanes of PCI Express. Each lane for PCI 4.0 was 16 GB gigabits per second per lane, which would translate to approximately two gigabyte per second per lane. Okay, so time 16 lanes gives us 32 gigabyte per second worth of bandwidth. Bandwidth was maximum throughput possible, right? Latency was 100 plus nanosecond, right? So these things, you guys remember? Yes. Right. Um, Let's try to look inside this GPU. What should I see based on whatever research you guys have done? Please talk out loud. Lot of cores. Okay. What else? You said memory? VRAM. What is the difference between VRAM and memory? Video RAM. Video RAM. Is it a special thing? No. Okay. Yes, it is different from the VRAM. It's different from VRAM. How? <laughs> okay, so it's special for the GPU so that it can access the memory uh, easily and faster. Easily and faster. Okay. Okay. Let's keep that thought on for uh, for a bit. Uh, uh, what else? Any other thoughts? What else should be there? Okay, so he seems to dissipate the, that would be there for CPU as well. Fair enough. But that's a passive component, so we'll ignore it for the time being. But I agree, he's there. Buses. Okay, so some sort of controller. Uh, what bus is GPU interacting with? PCI Express, right? So there would be some sort of a PCI Express controller on the GPU. Just like there's a PCI Express controller inside the CPU, similarly, it would be there on GPU. It needs to talk PCI. Okay. Ports on, uh, yeah, so external ports probably here, somewhere here. Okay, yeah. Uh, in today's conversation, we'll be focusing on the programming model of GPU, so ports will be less important, but I agree that it's there. Let's talk about memory. I disagree. There's no concept of memory on uh, PCI Express. Oh, sorry, on the GPU. The way uh, memory works, in the GPU is that there's a concept of uh, memory mapping and you think that you are using the memory here but it's actually getting routed via PCI Express. I didn't show the DRAM here, the main memory, but into the DRAM. That would be very slow. Yes. So the GPU. That would be very slow. Okay. At least, at least people have come with the right move today. Yes. You can test and not take everything on face value. Okay. That is correct. It would be very slow. All right? Yes, yes. Okay. So, first I thought very quickly together. Let's see how do we do in the second half of this session. Um, right. So, you're absolutely right. There has got to be memory here. Is memory of GPU faster or slower? Faster. Faster. 
Lesser latency should have come back to the lesser latency. Higher clock speed. Higher clock speed. Sir, I disagree. Clock speed of uh, GPU memory is actually slower than. Is that a lie or is that a fact? Why? Because Google tells you so? Uh, harder operations than the GPU. GPU only does the sim simple operations. Simple operations. What does that have to do with memory? Operations are not done in memory. Operations are done inside these so, You need to do operations when you access some data. Yes. So we. Okay, but like, how does that explain slower memory in GPU? Higher bandwidth. Mm. Who says so? Higher bandwidth. And what would that do? Why should we need higher bandwidth on the GPU? There are a lot more calculations. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. What does that have? Okay. So, so bandwidth on, so the memory bandwidth is likely higher. Although we've not completely, completely nailed down that thinking yet, we do that during the course of this thing. But what is certain is that you know it's likely is, what is likely is that the bandwidth is is high. You can see. Should be lower value. Because first of all, there is less distance between the processing and processing you mean here? Yes, yes. If there's less distance, latency is expected to be higher or lower? Okay. okay, so you said that latency of uh, memory on GPU is actually lower than the latency of CPU to DRAM. Yes. I disagree. Okay, we'll pause this uh, piece for now. We'll revisit this at some point in time. But we are getting, yeah. So since there are multiple cores in GPU, yeah. so we have to map many like, server wires for, to get to reach to memory. Okay. Yeah. So many wires would usually translate to buzzes. Okay, but with latency and throughput. Uh, but since we have several, late. several of those, uh. Uh, it will be hard like uh, the it won't be parallel, right? Like, you are asking me for your telling me. I get the, the way your brain, your brain is thinking that high brand bandwidth, if we have done it via a lot of multiple, multiple parallel uh, lines of wire, it won't reach at the same time. So yeah, we so we remember parallel. that the frequency will have to be yeah. lower yeah. in order to have that many parallel lines based on the last time's uh, conversation, right? Yeah. Okay. The question is, is the bandwidth, you know, gained in, on GPU by having tons of bandwidth? That's something that we'll visit later. But I, I like how you guys are at least trying to connect the dots, okay? Better than most software engineers that I meet. You guys are first years, right? Okay. So, yeah. So, on top of all of this, there would be PCI Express, correct? Let, let me, the quick question. What is faster, CPU or GPU? It depends on the type of the Okay. Sounds like something you, you know you read up yesterday. Huh? Mm -hmm. We thought GPU was faster, but uh, we learned that CPU is more powerful than GPU. Okay. In complicated things. So that's why we'll need CPU to do more heavy tasks. Mm -hmm. uh, it requires uh, more logic than the okay. power, computation power. So, did any of you test this or did you just believe it? Just believed it. Uh, you know, we've got to apply our own minds. Fortunately for you, I have. So, uh, let me see. Can you guys still see something on your uh, this thing? Uh, okay. Can you see things now? Yes. 
All right. Ah, yes, thank you. Thank you. I feel really like an oldie here. Okay. All right. So I've written a piece of code. It would be available on the same uh, GitHub repo. Okay. So let me do this. What did you did you want to check? Which is faster, right? So I have multiple tests. I'll do a basic multiply test. We take a vector. We take a large array of numbers. How many numbers? 10 million. And we run it with maximum parallelization. OK? For the timing, let me actually do minimum parallelization. We'll talk about it. But right now, we are comparing what is faster, right? And when we are comparing that, would you have like one person fight with 10 people at the same time? No, it should be fair, right? One on one. Okay? So when we are doing one on one, on one fight, is a CPU versus GPU fight. Okay? Let's actually make sure that we are testing one core of CPU with one core of GPU. Minimum parallelization. Okay? Let's compare. Okay? So. CPU has taken up 19 milliseconds to perform a multiplication on 10 million numbers. GPU has taken how much? 110 No, it's 1.4 seconds. Actually. Milli, it's, it's MS, not nanoseconds. Can you increase the faster? Is this better? Yes. yes. OK. So CPU has taken up 19 millisecond. GPU computation we are focusing on, okay? Because rest everything is data transfer and stuff, so ignore it. The GPU computation is taking up how much? 1357 millisecond. Okay? So that is approximately like what? 135 times faster, right? No. About 65 times faster. Right? We were so we are talking so gloriously about GPUs, right? As a lot of you had correctly read and understood, GPU power lies in its parallelization. Yes. Now let's do the same thing maximum. with maximum parallelization. Okay, and I'm sort of jumping the gun here a little. Oh, it got completed actually. So CPU was. 17, GPU is? 0.79. Hmm. So throughput is hiding what? Right? And unlike reading from the web, this time we actually tested it for us, as you always should. All right. So we did a quick check. The GPU's individual core ends up being much slower. And we validated it for, for ourselves. Much slower than the CPU. The power of a GPU lies in parallelization. Okay? That is going to be the theme of one of our conversation today. Okay? Parallelization means more throughput. Throughput helps hide latency. I just want to sort of so deeply bake that into you that so that is what you are repeating. Throughput hides latency. Okay? So, with all of this understanding, what is the understanding that we've had till now? That GPU makes sense only if we are actually using up all of those codes, right? Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Second thing that we understood is that CPU and GPU talk via a fairly slow lane, a fairly slow bus. The bus is the, not the technically correct word. Very slow link, PCI Express. Okay? 100 plus nanosecond, which is the reason why we wanted all of this memory. If these guys, all of these guys are busy, only then we'll actually use the power of GPU. Right? Imagine if all of them were getting their data from the main memory. Would they really be as occupied? Or would they be largely waiting for memory? That's the reason why I think some of you had pointed that out why we actually need memory, right? With all of this understanding and this low link, how should the CPU and GPU talk? Synchronously, asynchronously? 
From the last time, do you remember? <coughs> some of you are saying synchronously, some of you are saying asynchronously. Fight. Depend, depend your uh, line of thinking. Who says synchronously? I think so because uh, when we are entering the graphics, the CPU needs to wait for the CPU to complete all the uh, uh, calculations that need to be uh, done to uh, display the 3D graphics on the, to the plane so it will wait for it to complete and then display the That's a good point. Um, is waiting the same as being synchronous? Yes, it will stop yes. the processing until... Or if it can say that, okay, go ahead, <coughs> GPU, do your stuff, I will still need to wait before I let the results be shown to the program, but until then I do some other stuff. Yes, yes, yes. So is that contract synchronous or asynchronous? Asynchronous. All right. Synchronous means uh, you know it's you, your your line of reasoning I like because it actually points to the fact that synchronous and synchronous can sometimes be tricky to identify. Okay, you can have a synchronous programming model exposed while in the underlying layers things are actually working asynchronously. For example, when you do a file open and read from file in your program, often enough, what time you doing in your programming? Java. Java. Do you wait? Then do you say that while this file is getting opened, let me actually do some nice way? Do you write programs like that? Okay. No. Right? But the underlying there is sitting in this desk is I.O. going on a PCA Express, which means at a fundamental level, it's working in a asynchronous model. Fortunately, the OS is, is doing that impedance mismatch of when you call a file open, it put your process to sleep. So that while writing the program, you don't have to bother about it. Okay, the OS put it is to put it to sleep, dispatch the request. Whenever the response came back from the test, at that point in time, I it would sort of uh, awaken the process again. Okay, right? So, uh, good point is that synchronous and asynchronous can sometimes be a little uh, tricky. But from a programming model perspective, let's understand this CPU to GPU talk is low latency or high latency? High latency. High latency. Which means fundamentally, it's got to be asynchronous. Okay, all right. So we've got we've intuited the nature of API. Yes, some libraries might expose out a synchronous API to us, but we know that if you are seeing a synchronous API, it means that underlying level pay it is dealing with the asynchronous nature of it. Okay. Right? At, the, at the core level, the nature of talk between CPU and GPU is async. What kinds of talks should happen between CPU and GPU? What kinds of things? Imagine you are writing a program to be run on GPU. Right? What kinds of things should happen? Okay, so there's some, some code should get executed on the code. Right? What is so, so there is the coding part of it, right? There's some code thing that we have to deal with when we are writing a program, right? What else? Reading the result back. Yes, so that is one thing, which means that transferring data from what is here back to the CPU memory, right? Good, good example. What else? Where did the data in memory come from? Right? So, obviously, reading and writing also would be. Right? So, you know, we, we sort of transferred some data, stored it here, so that the GPU cores can then process. Once the data gets processed in the code, then it gets stored in the memory. To set back to the preferred line. So, 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 see, course can only do calculation, correct? Course can only do calculation. Calculation is done 
on Sunday or on Wednesday. Uh, almost always, I'm not getting the exception so much. But almost always, uh, you know, the, 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 the calculation is being done on Sunday. Okay? Say, for example, that data could look like um, here's a set of objects in a three dimensional space, like that. I've represented that then in some data structure. Now go ahead and actually render that on the monitor. Okay, or then give me a you know screen frame of pixels. So I gave it objects, I want to output as pixels. A whole bunch of calculation need to Those objects scale, I need to you know sort of put that those objects in some data structure inside the memory, correct? Only then course can actually do some calculations on top of it. Make sense? Any confusion? Okay. Um, so, reading data, writing data, what else? We are missing some basic, basic stuff. What do you want to do with the instructions? With the, with the instructions. The instructions. So, that's the code part, which is the first thing that we want to do. We want to execute some code on these codes. What else? How we do, you, you read up, uh, you've done three days, I like it. Uh, we'll come to this. So, okay, so we've got a lot of codes here. Should our work fan out into all of these codes? Or only some of them? Or how many of them? Should it be the same code that should be getting executed amongst all of them or different? Those are some of the questions that we also, we, we, we feel that we'll have to deal with it. We, we validate whether we are actually needing to do it or not. Make sense? What else? There are some, okay, some other basic stuff. One is obviously initializing it, which means reserving resources. All right? Okay. Another one would be before we can actually transfer, you know, write to this memory, we need to be able to do a uh, you guys have read C or no? No, no, no C. Yeah. Okay, so in J you guys have read Java, right? Yeah. So you do a new some object, correct? Right? Yeah. 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 Right? So when we do that, then the object, the some memory gets allocated in memory in the DRAM, and the object has some information very right? Similarly, a new or a malloc kind of a thing should exist here as well before we can write. Make sense? Okay. So these are some of the things that we need to deal with. So let me see if all of these have been uh, captured. Initialization we talked about, memory alloc, dealloc, data transfer, both you know to and from, and uh, executing code. Okay. So all of the yeah. How can code be used? Who will tell that? Would that be secure? That's that's an open question which we discussed just some time back. Uh, how does you know? All of these things actually, like how do we distribute our workload amongst all the codes? It's something that we need to deal with. It's something that I'm currently treating for the purpose of this session. I'm treating it as part of executing code. We talk about it in, in class. Okay, so let's talk about the um, first one: initialization. What should initialization initialization to actually look like? That's actually super straightforward. This is the actual code. Okay. All of the pieces of code that I'm showing you right now are a part of a file called recmultiply.html. There are two files that I'll be uploading to the repo, recmultiply.html. So that HTML file is a self-contained You only need that single file. It contains the code, all of the code, the end-to-end -end code of vector multiplication. Usikai snippet is what I'm showing you here. Okay? So, we get an we get reference to an adapter, graphics adapter, and we get access to the device. The device is what we are mainly interested in. Okay, this device acts as the entry point for all of our calls to DP. Okay, API looks super straightforward. This is the, this is the boring part, initialization. Okay, no major rocket science here. Any questions here? Shall I move ahead? A die is a function that I have written in that file. It logs an error 
and throws an error so so that there is early exit from the program. Log is also a function that I've written. Yes. Okay. These are the only two utility functions that I've written in this file. The second one is GPU memory allocation and data copy. Let's look at that. Remember, device was our primary entry point. So what we do is, you'll come across this notion very, very commonly in GPU program. We allocate a buffer. Okay, you remember that memory. We are allocating X amount of space in there. Okay, the, the device what create buffer is the API through which we actually allocate. So that memory is, is not become available to us. We cannot write on any random part of the memory, right? That would be a huge issue. Okay, we specify the size of the memory and we specify the purpose of this buffer. Okay, why is purpose needed? Food for thought. You guys think about it in your own free time, all right? In normal programming, you don't end up, whenever you are allocating memory, actually don't specify the purpose, right? In GPU, you end up doing so. In your free time, read up about why that is the case. But Abhikele, just assume that Karna, just because the people want us to. Yeah. Maybe it's because different codes are designed to have different kind of uses in the code execution. It will reserve those codes which are relevant to our purpose. Good point. Yes, that is actually the correct explanation. The reason why we need to specify purpose is because when we have allocated memory, there are different kinds of information we might, we might want to store in that memory. Okay. Some of that information needs to be stored in a certain way for hardwired pieces of logic, hard circuitry to be able to operate. Okay. So when we specify the purpose as that, that information actually goes and gets stored in a certain way in a particular area. Okay. We are using a fairly general usage sort of a thing. This is like a you know, uh, storage space. You, we can store anything in it. Okay. Other kinds of storage purposes would be like texture also storing vertex objects, texture objects. These are graphics programming related concepts that we'll not be talking about in this session. Okay. Just wanted to give you a sense of why purpose is needed. Yeah. Yeah. So whatever, so you specify it in byte lengths. Okay. Yeah. So in this case, remember we were multiplying uh, an array of number. We, the problem we are trying to solve is vector multiply. We take a vector and we multiply it with the same number. Each element of that vector we are multiplying with the same number, right? We need to be able to store that vector in the GPU memory so that codes can act on it, right? Of what size should be that uh, memory vector times vector ka byte length. Okay, so we are storing 32 bit number, which means every number is four bytes, which means that the byte length would be four times the size of the array. So for 10 million arrays, a 10 million size, we'll have 40 MB data. Vector is the array. Vector array, we know these are like, uh, interchangeable uh, things. Someday we should also discuss maths. Um, the CPU to GPU data copy looks something like this. Okay. Device.q.write buffer. Okay. Straightforward. Why is there a Q? Yeah. So it seems like we are queuing up a bunch of commands. Right? Why do we need to queue up commands? I heard same from synchronous stuff. Uh, That's a fair point. Yeah. So, so essentially, there is decoupling between the how the GPU is operating. It's operating in its own world at its own pace, and we want to be queuing stuff up. Right? That is the asynchronicity that we were talking about. That these two are clockwise they are decoupled systems. If they were working on the same clock, it would be synchronous. DRAM, CPU to DRAM, same clock. 
Okay, that's the reason why we use your synchronous data, S data. Right? This is asynchronous. If it's working on its own clock, this guy's working on its own. Okay? So we choose some. Okay. So good. We are actually making good progress, although I'm running a slightly slow. So now let's come to so we've covered memory allocation and data copy. Now let's come to how we should think about splitting code on the GPU. What is the problem that we wanted to solve? We got an array, a vector of numbers, and we wanted to multiply each number with a certain value. Right? How should we split it? It's a super duper simple process. Sorry? Binary. Okay? Binary would be two. So two splits? Then again. Then again. Okay. Fair enough. Anybody else? Uh, anybody has any other idea? So what are those multiples? Okay, so like, is it like you're saying each code should operate on a part of this array? Okay, fair enough. Goes back to the same logic that essentially you divide the process and having each unit of work deal with a subset of the array. Super simple, right? The simplest way to do this is to actually, uh, you know, if we had an infinite capacity, then for each element, we could actually have one core sort of working on it, right? Okay. So why is the color not showing up here? Okay, fair enough. Yeah. So someday we should discuss colors also. There's a lot of <laughs> right. So if we didn't have infinite capacity, then one way that we could think about this is that some part of the array. It's a very very huge array. So we have. We are looking at only a part of the array. We have like a start index and an end index, and each unit of work is covering some width, some n number of words. That's a, that's another way to split. If the width is one, goes back to that super simplest example that we were discussing. That every unit of work is multiplying only one element. Make sense? Everybody with me? Like no confusion about this, guys, because you know. If we don't get the execution context right, then we are we will not be understanding our whole bunch of things. Everybody good? Okay. Cool. Right? So once what we could do is we could this is a unit of work and we could keep repeating these units of work. Okay. This unit of work, when we write code for this, is what we refer to as a kernel. Okay, or a shader. These are two terms that the shader comes from the world of gaming development area. Kernel comes from the notion of the uh, compute side of uh, you know, last day compute side. Kernel is not the same as the OS kernel, or those of you with those studied some image thing, image kernels look very different. Okay, they, they are a different concept. This kernel is a compute kernel. Okay, there is a very small unit of program that we've written. The same program is running. In parallel, in a large number of cores, okay, with different segments of this array. Make sense? And we can have all of these execute in parallel, yes or no? Yes. Or, right? Otherwise, throughput gets screwed. And higher latency is going to show up, like that minimum parallelization thing that we discussed. Okay? All good? A question here is, can we, like, how many parallel instances we can actually create? Good. Our intuition is spot on. We'll discuss exactly, you know, some of the details uh, in the second half of this session. This is what a kernel actually looks like. Okay? You'll find this code in the file that I mentioned. The language is called WGSL. Okay, web GPU shading share or shader language or something like that. Okay, multiple different kinds of shading languages exist. Web GPU uses this. Okay, 
The syntax of this looks a little Rust-like, if for those of you probably looked up Rust as a language. Okay, super duper straightforward uh, uh, syntax, no major issue. There are some parts that I've covered that I've hidden from your view right now, which we'll talk about in a bit. Okay, the main thing is start index. Okay, the main, let me actually go through these one by one. Our kernel obviously needs the input array, the whole input array. And it needs which part of it it's actually working on. Right? These are the two pieces of information it would need. So the start index, let's assume that we get the start index through some means. Okay. Then we go from that start index to start index plus width. That width is what I'm calling as count or invocation. So invocation is like shader getting executed. It got invoked, shader plus invoked. Okay, so every shader invocation has a starting index and is covering some n number of words after that, uh, numbers after that. And we need only that much data. Make sense? Everybody good with this? Where does this array come from? And where does this start come from? Okay, let's first talk about the array. Shader is the unit of work that we actually define. Okay? Remember, we are executing some program parallel. Right? So n number of instances of that program is being run. That program is called a shader or a kernel. Okay? I'll keep on using these words interchangeably, so uh, no, forgive me for that. I should probably have stuck to one terminology, but okay. Um, so this is our program. Obviously, it needs the input, and it needs to calculate some start index. We'll figure out how the input actually comes from. What we create is, remember that CPU, GPU diagram that we had called up? Latency was super high. Would we want to be talking at each point of execution in the GPU, would we want the control to be in CPU, or do we want to sort of lay down how the program should be getting executed, all of the conditions and all of the flows, etc., and give it to GPU in one shot? One shot? Right? That is what we define in the pipeline. So we are essentially creating a uh, you know, uh, pipeline and a compute pass. Okay, so you can in a compute pass you can often end up actually having multiple kinds of uh, you know phases and uh, shaders essentially getting executed one after the other. Okay, so we provide our data here via, via a binding. So you have a shader now. Now you are binding this shader to into some data. Okay. That data is the GPU input buffer that we created. Remember, device what create buffer, right? So we've created that. We've written our data to that buffer, which means that in GPU memory that information is there now. And now we are binding that memory to this execution context. Okay, that is what this piece of code. It, it's not going to. I'm not expecting you guys to completely internalize it immediately. Just focus on the concept here, right? We have code. It needs data. That data. That data needs to be made available to it somehow. That is what we are doing by binding. So, so first we send the GPU the code and then we bind the data with it. If we if that is what is happening here. See, we create a we create a command encoder. Command so device dot create command encoder. What it is doing is it is creating a data structure in which we'll lay down all the steps that need to be done by GPU. And then we pass all of that to we create a command buffer from this encoder and we submit it to the GPU via the queue. Okay, so what we've done is all of these set of things we are telling the GPU. What are we telling the GPU? Begin compute pass, set pipeline, the pipeline that we had created. What did the pipeline say? Invoke this module. Add the function called main. What was main? This function that we created in the shader. Okay. Okay, so we in the pass, it's a compute pass. There can be multiple passes. Okay, say set pipeline, binding group. 
this binding group we had created here if you remember okay so we are passing this context we are passing this context then this is the part where we actually say we uh, this is the data context for the kernel the set binding piece this piece that i've hidden from you is it says execute this shader or this kernel across n number of cores okay i've hidden it because there are some concepts that we need to understand okay make sense i want to focus on just the you know high level picture right now then we say pass dot end and then we read back the results copy buffer to uh, sorry with the gp2 the gpu copy that we do and then from the copy that we did we actually read back the results okay we submit this to the gpu for execution this is what a high high level workflow so that concept is what i want to come to in the second half which is which is why i have hidden it right now okay um okay so this bind group thing do you guys notice is how we are passing the context the data with the code that marriage needs to happen okay that is what we are doing by this set bind group this is a very important thing okay so here if we go back if we look at this this is what how the data is being made available group 0 binding 0 okay do you see this this at the lower half of the code bind group do you see binding 0 that binding 0 is what we had seen here it is telling the gpu that you would find this data in this part of the memory okay and we are saying group 0 this group 0 is coming from this binding group 0 or good Zeroth bind of the zeroth bind group. Yes. There are several binds. Yes, you can have multiple binds, and in each bind, in, you can have several bind groups, and each uh, bind group can have multiple bindings to it. Okay. And then the data transfer from GP to CPU looks something like this. The memory that we had actually copied our data to inside the uh, the results to inside the GPU, we use this function map async. i cannot get into a lot of details of map async because it will have to exp, you know i'd have to explain mmio to you guys okay but you guys can read up about it yourselves if you are interested um or you can talk to me separately and i'm happy to explain out of curiosity okay so map async and then unmap between these two this information is this gpu memory is accessible to us for reading outside of these two that memory is not accessible a very important uh, piece to bear in mind okay in this particular code all that we are doing between this is validating that multiplication happened correctly so let's look at how things actually get executed when we do simple stuff like multiplying an array okay this is the code familiar code everybody understands it right there's a cpu core first let's look at how things get executed on the cpu there's a cpu core here there's a bunch of registers last time you guys remember in the memory hierarchy yes, register is the whenever we are doing any calculation information is actually fetched from the register yes. right so information first comes from memory to register and only then calculation can happen over there okay one of those registers is known as instruction pointer it tells us where in the which machine code are we pointing to right now okay so in this scenario let's assume that there is a bunch of instructions here then another instruction can you see that instruction pointer moving right at some point in time it will reach this step where we are doing the actual multiplication okay and it will show up as multiply the number available in first register with the number available in second register and store the result in the third register okay these are the three registers one of those registers is having the number 23 which which is what we want to multiply and the edx will probably have arri the ith element of the array and the result is going to get stored in eax all of this is done by an 
ALU. Anybody knows what an ALU is? <laughs> Good, at least it's basic. Okay, so, uh, so you know, this specific ALU is actually an integer execution unit. Integers are multiplied, divided, operated upon very differently from floating point. Okay, so the floating point execution units will look different from the integer execution units. Okay, which is, which by the way is one of the reasons why at a machine language level, you'll have an integer multiply versus a floating multiply. Okay, all right. So this ALU is going to pick the number from, fetch the number from EBX, it actually fetches in one clock cycle or lesser. Okay, fetches, fetches the other one, probably both of them in parallel, multiplies, stores. Okay, so this is what is the process looks like and it will do that repeatedly until the array, the whole array is actually uh, done. All right, so it will keep on moving step by step. What is happening here? What is my main compute unit? That is my ALU, okay? This is what defines my compute horsepower. Computing specifically, calculation, okay? This is what is known as SISD. Single instruction, single data, okay? So we are going through data one by one. At a, you know, and we are going through instructions one by one, we are going through data one by one, okay? So if I have to do uh, twice the number of, if the array length doubles, my time would double because it is going through it sequentially, correct? Yes. It is doing twice the number of calculations serially. So the time would double. Should we validate it or yeah, another, for by face value, we have applied some reasoning, but we should also validate, right? Let's do this. We'll do basic multiplication. 10 million CPU time took. So 20 million should take approximately, right? So CPU time is doubling. Did GPU time double? Yes, okay. But here's the thing. Let's do one million. CPU is 2.8. Take note of the GPU also. CPU time. Mm. Yeah, CPU time doubled, right? GPU time didn't. Intuitively, what might be happening? Yes, right? The GPU might still have some more compute capacity left in it. Remember, CPU is going through serially. So even if there is spare capacity, that is still lying idle. Right? So we are, we are still going to go through it one by one. GPU on the other hand, because we are always maxing out the parallel, specifically I've coded it in a way that maxes out parallelization. There's some more capacity left. Usme deploy kar diye. In the puri that we were making, there was still more space left for the, for throwing in, going back to the example from the previous session. Make sense? Because it's SISD, it's going through things serially, doubling the workload means doubling the time. To counter this, CPU manufacturers came up with the idea of SIMD, okay? SIMD, single instruction, right? Okay, what should be happening here just by hearing the name? Yeah, so one instruction is leading to multiple data points getting, getting processed, right? The way it happens is, you can, the, the, the history of SIMD, but we'll come to this. Uh, we'll just use the latest one, which is ZMN. These are 512-bit registers, okay? So fairly uh, wide registers, which means that each one of them can store 64 8-bit numbers, or 32 16-bit numbers, or 16 32-bit numbers. Make sense? Right? Similarly, 64-bit you can calculate by yourself, 8. 64-bit numbers, right? This is the instruction. 
those interested search for simd intrinsics you can search for it if you are interested what other simd commands exist what it would do is it will take this 512 bit wide register mm512 which means that it is operating on 512 wide register and multiply in unsigned 32 bits so it will break up this 512 bit register as unsigned 32 bit numbers the one here 32 bit number is going to multi get multiplied with this 32 bit number this one with this one you guys understand what's happening all of that is happening in one shot right so which means that we have done a lot more calculation than if we would have gone through things serially make sense right and store it in another register this is x16 times 32 bit so you know uh, 16 32 bit multiplications we are doing in one shot okay all of this is still going to require that much alu resource naturally right okay so this is the degree to which cpu has gone ahead and tried doing stuff simd is very very poorly used resource in most cpus okay it is largely used by underlying libraries for example your cryptography libraries for you know execution of algorithms will use simd registers to greatly sort of accelerate the process okay but usually in programming most people don't end up using it because the programming model is a little tricky it requires you to think about things think about the width think about whether this is available on the does the cpu the cpu that i'm using does it have 512 bit registers or does it have 256 bit registers and you know based on that i'm going to have to decide okay so because of the a lot of these issues these things end up getting used only by the underlying libraries at times not by end programmers directly okay so this is less flexible control flow is missing you don't notice that there's no if else kind of uh, not a lot of that is possible here right so basic arithmetic you can do right let's look at how a cpu compares with a gpu architecturally we have understood sisd we have understood si simd okay uh, let's look at how things actually work because of uh, are the color differences are there so this was supposed to be orange actually control me okay in your script that was blue okay all right so control is the logic which actually deals with uh, just say if else and you know a bunch of other uh, instruction decoding from the machine code to in internally how command should get processed all of that logic okay fetch from memory and store to memory all of that kind of stuff is in control and the rest everything is the actual processing unit okay what is going to be our ultimate choke point if you are computing a lot of stuff what are we going to be limited by which in this case it's not uh, so, so slowest path in this case it would it would end up being alu right we would usually run out of alus much more particularly if you are trying to do a lot of things in parallel right so cpus you would have in your research it would have shown up as cpus are designed for latency right while gpus are designed for throughput what does that translate to intuitively when you when we think about it so in gpus like should we expect same amount of alus less more why right so we are we are doing a lot of calculations in parallel right so if we do not have that many remember alus are hardware circuits right so if there is not lot of alus things will have to get queued up a lot more if you have only four alus as against 40 alus right 40 things in parallel versus only four things in parallel huge difference now here's the thing that i want us to intuitively think about if it was so easy to add alus why have cpus not done it so limited space right which means that if you are giving more space to alus something will have to be reduced right control will have to control is one of the things because that's the only block i've shown <laughs> are there any other things that you can think about why is control taking so much space good question 
Anybody? Why is control taking up so much space? So what? So CPUs are optimized for latency or throughput? Latency. latency, all right. The way a lot of latency is reduced is by having very, CPU to DRAM was how many? 50 nanoseconds kind of a thing, right? It was like many, many, many clock cycles, all right? To like three nine one 150 to 200 clock cycles. CPU should be really running really, really slow. But what CPU does internally is that it, it has a concept of pipelining. You may think that logically CPU is executing this instruction. Once it is done, then I'll move to this instruction. Once it is done, then I'll move to the next instruction. But in practice, what it is doing is it is actually executing a lot of these things in parallel. Okay? In a way, that is hidden from us. It's not exposed to the programmer. We cannot control it, okay? Uh, it's not a hardware class, pure hardware class, so I cannot uh, get into a lot of details of it. But to manage all of that without introducing mistakes requires a lot of complicated circuitry, okay? So it uses internal control throughput to hide memory latency, okay? So it is designed for a lot of different kinds of tasks, okay? It will uh, execute, like from within the same task also, it will actually execute a bunch of different instructions. While an instruction is waiting for memory, let me queue up, let me try executing another one, and a bunch of those sort of things, okay? So that's the reason why control is really, really thick, because control logic is how it actually tries to hide lat latency. Make sense? So that's really thick which means that in GPUs, if we were to increase ALUs, and like some, a few people were suggesting, control were to be very limited, what does that mean? So control cannot be very complicated then. Control will have to be super simple. Have you seen an example of a super simple control logic with much higher execution bandwidth, Abita? SIMD, how many executions happened in one instruction? 16, inst 16 parallel things actually happened at the same time, right? What if we were to try to mix the two up? We need to have a lot more ALUs. Increasing the ALUs means lesser space for control. Lesser space for control then means that we cannot have very complicated ways of hiding latency we'll actually need to have like one single instruction processing needs to give me maximum possible return from it. Because my control logic is very thin, every single instruction execution needs to give me very large amount of return for, for it, correct? Because my control logic is now, like uh, is now in a much more tiny area. GPU is actually filled with ALUs. That's the intuitive, intuitive feeling that we have because it needs to execute a lot more things in parallel. Each one of these LUs, uh, sorry, each one of, of uh, these LUs is taking up some space, which means that there's lesser space left now. Something has to give, right? Because if, if we could add LUs without any cost, then CPUs may be cut then Yeah. So why do we have limited like storage or limited size capacity? Because transistors can be only, uh, you know, ultimately they will have a finite size, right? And if you have like, you know, n billion transistors versus two n billion transistors, which means that your die si your chip size is going to double. Double size means quadratic in quadratic increase in your thermal dissipation. Okay, so that means that much more heat than I have to actually focus on removing, and cost is another uh, constraint that. The bigger the chip, that much higher the cost. If we ignore the cost, uh, will it be viable? Of course, there is a there's a company called um, what is the name of that full uh, wafer-sized uh, chips? 
Sir, Cerebrus. Cerebrus, right? Yeah, so there's a company that actually, uh, uh, so you know, chips are manufactured like there's a wafer of silicon, okay, and you sort of imprint the circuit on, on that wafer and then you cut things out, okay. There's, uh, there's a company that I essentially uses almost the full wafer as one chip, or, or a fairly large part of it as one chip, okay. So those things are there, but those are like a little more niche hardware architectures, all right. Okay, let's, let's focus on this for now. Control logic is very limited. Okay, because we've given space to a lot of ALUs. If control logic is very limited, I cannot rely on fancy control logic to, to maximize uh, my return on instruction, correct? I cannot rely on control logic to maximize the re return on instruction. I'll need to rely on something else, okay? We've seen one example of that in SIMD where what it was doing was one instruction actually ha ha gets hardwired into, into you know, multiple uh, things happening in parallel, right? What if we were to try to marry the two? This is what a GPU core actually looks like. A whole bunch of ALUs effectively. I'll talk about what these different ALUs do. Very thin control logic. And we've got a fairly large set of register files, okay? Because lots of ALUs would mean that much more uh, registers they need to be able to process, like pull data from, correct? So we've got fairly much larger number of registers than in CPU. We've got an L1 cache here, okay? Similarly, there could be another, uh, you know, GPU core. Core is not the, because, you know, it can be confusing uh, with, with some of these cores, just remember this as unit of work core sort of a thing, okay? L2 cache and then GPU global memory, okay? GPU memory has higher bandwidth over a latency, okay? So what needs to happen is that all of these ALU cores need to be churning out maximum work, okay? Can we take inspiration from SIMD? What if one single instruction leads to exactly the same step being executed on each one of these cores? That's one way for us to think about it, taking inspiration from SIMD again, right? If SIMD was multiplying 16 32-bit numbers, okay, it means that 16 ALU units were actually being used, ALU units which have the ability to add 32-bit numbers. Make sense? Right, you can think about resource capacity in that way because ultimately those additions will still need to be done somewhere, okay? So it's not like, you know, just you can sort of, uh, you know, uh, it, it is not happening magically. Those additions, that many number of additions needs to be backed by, you know, compute capacity, okay? So here, one of the ways we can do it, or do it is by having we can have thinner control by making sure that all of these are moving in lockstep, just like in SIMD. One instruction, all the cores are processing the same instruction. That's one way for us to think about it. So if, for example, I have, let's say, uh, you know, 16 shader kernels, every shader kernel is going to break down into some machine code, right? Okay, every kernel is going to break down into n number of series of steps. If I'm having 16 shader invocations happening in parallel, they are running in parallel, 16 of these ALUs are moving in lockstep. At the end of it, I will have 16 getting done in one shot. Because they are running in lockstep, Instruction processing for each ALU is being done in only one place, correct? Is that making sense? Let's look at what this looks like in practice. I'm going to call each uh, you know, kernel invocation or shader invocation as a thread. Okay, so I have five threads running here, all right? Each thread has a dedicated register. Remember that very thick register file exists, okay? So data is available for, uh, for each thread to in, in one cycle, okay? 
one particular instruction, let's say add instruction is done. All of these threads, one individual thread is getting run on one single ALU core. Instruction being passed by that control logic. Okay, the control logic sort of decoded that instruction and told the cores what to do. And because 16 cores are doing the same thing that the control unit told them, we are now getting a better bang for the buck, correct? Than if we were doing it things in a SISD fashion. Make sense? Okay. With me, not with me? Okay. So this is known as SIMT. Single instruction, multiple threads. Okay. So it marries SISD with SI with SIMD. Okay. We are essentially, you know, uh, writing logic that we are writing logic as regular code. Remember in SIMD, only well-defined set of instructions were there. Multiply 32-bit uh, numbers, add 16-bit numbers, only those basic intrinsics were there. Here, we can actually have any regular logic. Any regular logic. Remember shader code that we had written? That looked like regular code, right? That regular code, when it is broken down into, as, into assembly instructions, what is happening is multiple cores are processing the same instruction in lockstep. That is how GPU and CPUs differ. Make sense? This is very important to understand, guys, okay? Because compute capacity cannot come for free. It has to come at a cost. That cost is paid in control logic. Let's see how. What is that cost? Can anybody imagine the cost here? Like what cost are we paying here? Let's see. Let's say there are a bunch of threads, five threads running. One instruction got executed, another instruction got executed. All of them are happening. Control unit says, execute this instruction, execute add, execute multiply, execute subtract, execute load from memory, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so each one of the codes is just keep on doing what the, what the control unit is actually telling them. At some point in time, they encountered an if instruction. Okay, the condition is going to be validated by all the cores. Okay, for those, what happens from here? This is very crucial, so pay very close attention. If, if any one of you is zoned out, you know, this is now the time to get back into the zone again. If condition got executed, some of these threads are going to give me, true, some of the threads are going to give me but the instructions are getting executed in lockstep. So what happens? Control unit is just telling, control unit is sending a set of, do this now, do this, do add, do multiply, blah, blah, blah. Okay? If condition encountered, a branching has happened, what would happen? Two of these, the first two threads, let's assume they got a, true in their condition. The other ones got a false. These guys get blocked down. We call them masking. These guys get masked out. Why? Because the true condition cannot be evaluated for them because the data that these guys are working on, the data that these three threads are working on is different. And for them, the condition turned out to be false. Okay? Which means if the condition is false, they cannot be logically executing the condition in the if code. It has to be in the else code, right? So they get masked out. They, they are sitting there idle, not doing anything, okay? Similarly, it will keep happening until we encounter an else. The moment that happens, the first two get masked out and the others keep moving. The ones that had been marked out, masked out earlier. Make sense? At some point in time, we encounter an end if, and after that, normal processing continues. This is known as divergent control flow, which means that in GPU cores, if else has a cost. 
whenever multiple invocations of your shader are happening in the same GPU unit, and there is an if else, at part of the time, something is executing, something is not executing. So your core capacity is getting wasted. What are the effects of this? One, an executing thread group, a group of those invocations, will always block on the longest thread. Imagine a for loop, okay? The for loop ka condition is defined as such that let's say thread one has 1,000 invocations while thread uh, 1,000 steps, okay, in, in the same invocation, whereas another shader invocation has only 10 steps being executed in a for loop. Code is the same, but the data was such that this first one has to go through some step 1,000 times, another one has to go through step only 10 times. 990 times this guy is lying idle, okay? And this is what a question that sometimes I ask whenever I encounter engineers who are sort of focusing on the lower level GPU stuff. How does, if GPU is so good in parallelization, why should we not do multi-processing on GPUs? Multitasking on GPUs. Yes, yeah, similar type of task, right? I'm trying to get us to think why that is the case. The reason is GPUs are good only at data parallelization. If data, logic being completely different, things will get screwed up as we are seeing if else. Okay? Task based parallelization, GPUs, GPUs are very, very poor. There are different kinds of parallelization. You, you can split up data into same, same logic, but split it up into different data. Another is very different logics. So you split up your whole thing into very different kinds of logic, each one executing on a separate core. GPUs are very poor at this kind of thing. GPUs are very good at this kind of a thing. Very important to understand, okay? And why that is the case? Because of SIMP. Because within each core, things are executing in lockstep. Within each core, different cores can be, you know, executing independently, but within each core, that core that we were seeing where there was int 32, FP32, tensor cores and all of that stuff, within that, things are moving in lockstep. Outside of that, things can be running independently. Make sense? So the control flow knows, control flow uh, gets to know that when a condition is, evaluated, con the condition itself is a bunch of machine instructions, right? that machine instruction is going to have something like a compare this number to this. If the comparison is true, then this is the uh, machine code that you need to jump to. If the condition is false, that is the machine code that you need to jump to. At any point in time, the control logic is going to have to pick, control logic is only one, so it will have to pick one of them. It picks the first one, starts executing, because it knows that for the other threads, the jumping that they have, they have informed the, uh, logically speaking, they have informed the, um, control unit that I need to jump to that thread, that location, that machine instruction. Control flow, hold on. Okay, so it will mo start moving on this, and when it has completed this, it will start executing on this. Make sense? Yeah. Break condition. Break condition. Break condition is also a, 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 a you know logical like control divergence, right? So break condition is essentially bypassing a series of uh, instructions, correct? It, break condition always leads to a jump effectively in a machine uh, machine code, okay? So every jump is essentially a, uh, you know, potential for control flow divergence, okay? So it, that will also behave similarly, yeah. Sir, how does GPU code parallelization? How does? See, oh, good point. Uh, so. Uh, in case of CPU, let's assume that there are different cores that are executing this, right? In CPU, each one of these lines has a different control flow to it. Okay, each one has a, has a different control logic. Control logic is much thicker. So, this guy might be using on a different set of, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, sort of 
It can move independently of this because each one of them has a different inst instruction pointer. Different cores, different instruction pointers. GPU may, there are tons of cores, okay, lots of those ALUs, but a bunch of ALUs get uh, used only a single control logic. So instruction pointer is going to be only at the control logic level, which is why in GPUs, these ones are moving in lockstep. Okay, instruction pointer is in the control logic layer. Okay, uh, another example of the divergent control flow is if else are executed serially, okay? Within the same executing group, okay? If it is, you remember, you guys remember this, right? Uh, you guys remember this, right? Threads executing within this are one group. Threads executing here is another group. This group can move independently of this. This group moves in lockstep, okay? Everybody clear on this? Okay. What would be the effect of this? Huh? Output? Huh, if we are not careful, then you know the time can actually be much more. So let's do a demo here. So we, have, we are back to this, okay? Let me clear the logs. Font size is visible, right? Yes. So let me do a heavy. This, this kernel does heavy computation. Okay, so in every step, it is doing a fairly heavy calculation. What do you mean by heavy computation? Means every kernel invocation takes uh, more time than, in that if condition, there's a lot more time being spent as compared to a uh, light. And they have more if else? No, more calculations being done. No, not, not, not a lot of if else, okay? Uh, CPU time taken, 119, GPU time, Okay, let me do heavy every 10 elements. In the first one, we were doing for every element. In the second one, we are doing for every 10 elements. What do you expect? CPU ke case mein? By? 10 times. And in case of GPU? Both of them are executing 10 times, I mean, every 10th element. The code is written in that way. What do you expect? It's like, can you explain what heavy every 10 is doing? What heavy every 10 is, is doing? Okay, so it is, it, uh, what, so heavy is doing uh, for the amount of that width, I am doing very heavy calculation for each element in that width. Very heavy calculation, basic arithmetic, no conditions. In the heavy every 10, for every 10th element, so if my index modulus 10 is zero, mod 10, you, mod 10 you guys understand, right? If index mod 10 is zero, then I do the heavy calculation and there is no else. If index percentage 10 is zero, I do heavy calculation, otherwise no. That is heavy every 10. Clear? Okay, so let's actually do the calculation and see what happens. Heavy every, heavy ka data hum ke paas hai, heavy, heavy every 10. What is that we see? CPU is? So almost like, you know, not exactly one tenth, but you know, close enough. You know. GPU? GPU is almost the same, right? SIMT? Does Simti explain this? Think about it. How so? How so? Simti. Yeah, Simti. What we learned just now, control divergence, divergent control flow. Yes, so instructions same instructions are going through. So you'll have nine out of 10 times you have masking of the course. Do you see how these tiny differences can make such a tremendous difference? These are the small, small things that add up in explaining how GPUs are separate from CPU, okay? Let's come to grouping kernel uh, invocations. 
most important last part, baki everything is actually a bit of a you know, good to know type features. This is what the GPU core actually looked like, okay? Remember that each such core would be executing some n number of invocations, shader invocations in a lockstep way, right? Notice there are different kinds of cores. In 32 cores, floating point cores, tensor cores, what are tensor cores? Specifically matrix multiplication. Because matrix multiplication is a very common activity in a whole, in graphics, AI, all of those things. So dedicated tensor cores. So instead of you coding out a shader or a kernel doing matrix multiplication, tensor cores can actually do it for you. Okay, that is what these cores are for. Coming to the important piece here, each one of these n number of instances get queued up in one single core. So this control logic is, you know, queuing up all of these things. And in batches, in some batches, those batches are, batch size is governed by uh, the number of ALUs here, correct? It is going to pick those n number and start dispatching them in these cores. Okay, one batch done, tuck, pick, next, uh, you know, so let's say this is 16, and this n was 64. Okay, 64 things got queued here, 16 dispatched, another 16 dispatched, another 16 dispatched, you get what I'm saying? Okay, so this is known as, a, as one work group which naturally means that one work group has a size to it, okay? One work group, every invocation within a work group is guaranteed to get deployed on the same core, okay? Make sense? Because without it, we'll not actually get the, uh, you know, benefit of SIMT, okay? We'll have another work group which will get deployed on a different core probably, okay? Sometimes it can get deployed in the same core also, but in general, it is separate, you know, uh, separate. As such, we'll have M number of work groups. How many total invocations have happened? Each instance is one inv invocation. N times M, okay? This is how workload is organized. This is what I had masked out. Okay, so the kernel, the, the kernel will actually, when we are writing the kernel, we specify the size of one work group, which is usually 64, it's a default thing. Why? Because the total number of ALUs in all, irrespective of the manufacturer, the number of ALUs is less than 64. Okay, so you, uh, web GPU also tells you what is the maximum number that you could, what is the maximum value of N that you could give but uh, you know, you can, usually 64 is what you end up putting up uh, because if, even if the LUs are 16, there is a backlog that has been created. Advantage of backlog, whenever there is a memory fetch instruction that is getting executed. Say for example, we want memory. That memory is going to take time. There's memory latency even on GPU, which is by the way higher than the CPU memory latency, okay? While it is waiting for that, memory to be fetched, PHK threads can be scheduled out. Okay, so you need deep queues. Deep queues are better. Okay, make sense? Another, you know, uh, factor to bear in mind. L1 cache is here, dedicated for this. All the threads that are fetching memory and doing calculations are going via, memory addressing is going via this, which means that if all the threads within a work group if all these instances within a work group are largely accessing the same block of memory, things would be faster, okay? Because the first set of 16 threads that got executed, they fetched memory, that memory is now cached. If the second group of 16 threads that get pulled, if they are also using the same, largely the same area of memory, spatial locality, remember? Yes. The first, in the first session we talked about spatial locality of memory, that is the advantage of cache, okay? So the question is that if you were to write 
your kernel code in a way that within the same work group, you're not accessing similar zones of memory, then things should be If you're not accessing the same zones of the memory, then things should be much lower for you. It's an assignment. You guys will need to validate it. Okay? Make sense? All right. So we've already discussed the advantages, spatial locality. Co another advantage is cooperation. These instances can cooperate a lot more, whereas different work groups cannot cooperate. Cooperate in terms of, I have written this, another thread is reusing what I've written. That kind of a stuff, okay? So within the same work group, you can cope. This is why the work group size is actually governed by the, is specified in the kernel. Whereas the number of work groups is specified in your pipeline. The work group, the shader code, the shader code under spatial locality logic in your code is going to be where? Inside the shader code, correct? You are accessing arrays in a certain way, array elements in a certain way, right? You are not pulling array elements randomly, you are going through them sequentially, right? All of that locality is inside the shader code. So the same work group, okay, should largely try to use spatial locality as much as possible, which is why the size of the work group is often specified with as part of the shader code, okay, as we'll see. So this is what it looks like, work group size. 64, like I said, you, that's usual. Number of work groups we'll have to calculate, okay? Right, because 64 invocations within, the work group, work, within one work group is what we've set already by number of, by work group size. Now we will have to calculate how many such work groups would be needed to cover n number of elements in the array, okay? You guys can go through this condition by yourself. There's no major sort of uh, this thing. What if the SIMT unit does not have sufficient capacity? Things will get queued up. If work group size, remember, one work group gets queued up only on the same core. So if we, if we don't have 64 ALUs available, things will get queued up on the same core, okay? Revisiting this. The group and bindings have been already covered. This is what I had hidden, work group size. Okay, and add compute means this is a compute kernel, compute shader. There are different kinds of shaders. Compute shader, okay. The way WebGPU works is it gives you a global ID. Okay, you can also get a local ID. Global ID is what is the, in this emeth work group, what is the ID of this instance n times m minus 1 plus 2. Make sense? Right? So that gives us an ID. It gives, at runtime, it gives the shader invocation an idea of where in the overall organization am I sitting in. Using that, I can calculate which is the part of the data that I need to act on, which is what we are doing here. We calculate the start index using the thread ID, using the global thread ID, okay? I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. You guys can read through the code. It's actually fairly straightforward, okay? Revisiting GPU code, the pipeline and you know the, all the enqueuing of commands that we were doing. This part is what I had hidden. Dispatch work groups. Remember, work group size is, is, is inside the shader code, whereas the number of work groups is part of the pipeline, uh, you know, the pass uh, logic, okay? So these many work groups are going to get dispatched. Now the GPU driver is going to go figure out how to actually spread it out into codes. Make sense? GPUs for AI. AI is nothing but matrix ma manipulations, okay? Which means it is? Very fast to do on GPU, why? Because we have separate cores. Separate cores for matrix. Uh, that's actually true, tensor cores, okay? But even if you didn't have tensor cores, would it, would it, would it still be faster for, on GPU? Matrix manipulation is a set of specific instructions. 
in tensor cores. Otherwise, it is not a specific set of specific hardware instructions. Matrix multiplication is hardware instructions only in tensor core. Otherwise, you will have to write it as a shader. Is matrix multiplication inherently parallelizable? Yes. Right? All of us have studied about it, yes? And all of AI calculation happens on GPU, tells us that it has to be parallelizable. Um, but have we actually validated for ourselves that it can actually be parallelized? No. Like always, we have actually taken the learning from somebody without actually assessing it for ourselves. That is also an assignment. You will implement matrix multiplication on web GPU. You will write kernels that actually do matrix multiplication. That is the best way to actually uh, get familiarized with the code base of web GPU. Okay? The code I'll put out, I'll send you guys the link. Write out, the, write out a kernel that actually does matrix multiplication. Okay, tensor cores do that same logic in hardware. Just like that SIMD intrinsic, there is actually a single instruction FMA, which actually can do it at a matrix level, okay. Um, neural engine, this new concept has actually started. And Apple being Apple, a lot of information is not available. GPU cores is actually shader cores we've heard about. RT cores, again, hardware, uh, you know, uh, co cores that are hardwired to do ray tracing, okay? So ray tracing you can also implement in software by yourself, but, uh, you know, to accelerate it even further, RT cores, okay? The shading language for Apple is metal, okay? Um, the shading language is actually, uh, okay, sorry, uh, that's metal shading language, it should be MSL, okay? Usual CPU runtime, neural engine. Remember, different kinds of cores existed. Yes, sir. Based on reverse engineered information, Apple's neural engine seems to support int 8, int 16, floating point, floating point 16. Okay, these are floating point 16 bit, floating point 32 bit. 32 bit can represent a lot more decimals. Just you know, at a layman's language. Okay, 16 bit can represent lesser number of decimals. So precision is lower in FP16. In AI, there are two kinds of phases. Inference, training. Training comes, comes first when you're training a model. Inference is when you are using a trained model to do stuff, okay? Training requires higher precision. Inference can actually be done on lower precision using a bunch of techniques like quantization, et cetera, okay? No FP32 would mean neural engine would be Good or bad for training? Bad. bad. Low precision. Okay. You currently take it on face value. Whenever you go through AI course, you guys can understand this better. Uh, but for inference, it is fast. So Apple has done a trade-off that I am, by sacrificing FP32, I'm actually giving more core space, more number of ALUs for inference like int calculations or FP16 calculations, okay? So these sort of designs we say as inference uh, preferring designs. Inference is fast by trading off training. Make sense? Okay, most NPUs follow the same, consumer NPUs follow this. Uh, you know, uh, higher end GPUs like uh, NVIDIA H100, et cetera, you'd find a lot more FP32, a lot more tensor cores, all of that stuff, okay? Because training is a big, it's, it's designed for that kind of thing. So if you're using H100 for largely inference, you are essentially doing a little bit of poorer ROI, okay? Little bit, not, not a lot, but just saying. Um, Last piece, uh, web GPU shader flow. We talked about, we write shaders in web GPU in which language? WGSF. It's not JavaScript, it's WGSF, okay? The way it actually gets executed is your browser will have something like a WGSL compiler, which compiles it into, depending on the platform, on Windows, HLSL, which is a DirectX, Direct3D based shading language. This is a discussion that we were having on the WhatsApp group. H HLSL, 
uh, getting, you know, as part of DirectCD, getting deployed on, you know, using Microsoft's DirectX framework to get executed on the GPU. On Apple, metal shading language, metal uh, onto the, G G uh, the GPU. Others, some, you know, Vulkan is, a, is one of the uh, sort of libraries that, as we discussed. Uh, SpearV is the intermediate format. Things essentially end up getting compiled into SpearV and then, uh, you know, deployed using Vulkan, okay? So this is how web GPU shader flow actually ends up happening. Summary, so we ended up talking about SISD to SIMD to SIMT. GPUs work on SIMT, okay? CPUs work on SISD and SIMD. Web GPU basic workflow we discussed, initialization, memory allocation, write to memory, setting up, uh, write to me setting up uh, the shader code, linking it up with the bindings or, and the data, okay? Setting up the compute pipeline and the passes, send it all to GPU for processing, read the results, done, okay? Shader is the basic unit of code, gets invoked very, very large number of times in parallel. Thread organization hierarchy we discussed, work groups. We discussed GPU core versus CPU core in a much more detail than what most people know. Uh, we discussed why GPUs work well for AI. Neural engines trend, which usually end up preferring inference and not training, and now you know why. Why? FP32 cores are missing, and training requires 32-bit precision, yeah. All right, thank you, congratulations. You, now, you guys now know more about GPUs than 99% of Bangalore software engineers. <laughs> okay, guaranteed, I can guarantee you this, okay? Um, there's one assignment that I have, which is a puzzle. Some of you may have heard about these puzzles I actually used to do. Uh, this puzzle is an interesting one. Let's look at index add mul. What does the test description says? This mixes add and multiply. If the index is even, we add. If the index is odd, we multiply, okay? There is some result that we get. Actually, sorry, let me do it 10 million times because, you know, my machine is a little fast. Okay, so I ran this now, right? 10 million, yeah, okay. Then there is a num add mul. What it does is, same logic, but instead of on index, it is actually calculating on the value, the number that it is operating on, okay? Let's compare CPU performance, 24 went to 54, right? GPU went from? Right. Okay. Yeah. Why is there a difference? Hmm. Answer is not easy, which is why I'm specifically calling out this as a puzzle. I'm not going to discuss the answer here. Uh, if any of you actually figure out an answer, you should write a blog about it. And you can, you could be a little famous inside your circle. Okay? It's not a very trivial thing. Uh, small hint, this is linked with one of the puzzles I had already put out. I'll share the full list of puzzles. Uh, you guys figure out which one is this linked with. It will point you in the right direction, but it will not give you the answer. So you'll still need to think for yourself. If you crack it, do share with me uh, what is the answer, and I would probably give you some award if you figure out an answer. Probably, not guaranteed. All right? Uh, that's it, guys. Thank you so much.